Right, I'm waiting. Okay, can you guys hear me? It's time for me to look at the chat. It's the first time doing live streaming. Oh, hi. Okay, right. I'm still waiting. We'll talk about it later. All right, so I don't think I can wait for the rest of them right now. So uh, this time I'm using I'm using Wikipedia as a source for me to tell you all about James Pro. All right, so he was born in Bender, which was a city which is nearby Calcutta, Bengal. But he's being a, he's being baptized in Sacro, a suburb in Benares. So. His father, Thomas Brooke, was an English judge in the Court of Appeal at Barely, British India. So his mother, Anna Maria, was born in Hertfordshire, was the daughter of a Scottish, Scottish peer, Crowner William Stewart, the ninth lord 
Blantyre, Blantyre, and his mistress Harriot Harriot Tisdale Brooke stayed at home in India until he was sent at the age of twelve in England for the brief education at Norwich School from which he ran away. So some home tutoring though some home tutoring some home tutoring followed in Bath before he returned to India in eighteen nineteen as an ensign in the Bengal Army of the British East India Company. He saw an action he saw action in Assam during the First Anglo Burmese War until seriously wounded in eighteen twenty five and sent back to England again for recovery. And then after this, five years later, then Five years later, he arrived back in Madras, but was too late to rejoin his unit. So he signed, at, so he resigned his commission. So he remained on the ship. He had travelled out the castle Hanli and returned home via China. So I am talking about Sarawak right now. We're not focusing about the early life. So Brooke attempted to trade in the Far East, but was not successful. So in 1835, he inherited 30,000 pounds, which he used as capital to purchase a 142-town schooner, Royalist. Set, setting sail for Borneo in 1838, he arrived in Kuching in August to find the settlement facing an uprising against the Sultan of Brunei. So greatly, greatly impressed about the... Malay archipelago. So in Sarawak, he he met the Sultan's uncle, the the Pangiran Buddha Hashim, to to whom he gave assistance in crushing the rebellion, thereby winning the gratitude of the Omar Ali Saifuddin the second, the twenty third Sultan of Brunei. So who is in who in eighteen forty one offered broke the governorship of Sarawak in return for his help. So he was highly successful in suppressing the widespread piracy of the region. So however, some Malay nobles in Brunei unhappy over Brooke's measures against piracy arranged for the murder of Muda Hashim and his followers. Brooke, with assistance from a unit of Britain's China squadron, took over Brunei and restored its sultan to the throne. So in 1842, the sultan ceded complete sovereignty to Sarawak to Brooke. So he was granted the title of Raja, which you know it's the White Raja already, on the 24th September 1841. Although the official declaration was not made until 18 August 1842. So other than that, besides Sarawak, he, he also began 1844 in anti-pirate operations with the ships of the Royal Navy and East, the East India Company of, of N.E. Sumatra on the 12th February. He received a gunshot wound to his right arm, right arm over here, and a spear cut to his eyebrow in, the, in their second engagement at Murdu. Later in 1844, presented the island of Labuan to the British government. He was appointed as the governor and the commander-in-chief of Labuan in 1848. So during his reign, Brooke began to establish and cement his rule over Sarawak, reforming the administration, codifying laws and fighting piracy, which proved to be an ongoing issue throughout his rule. Brooke returned temporarily to England in 1847, where he was given the freedom of the city of London, appointed British Consul Gener General in Borneo, and created a Knight Commander to the Order of Bath, KCB. Brooke pacified the native peoples, including the Dayaks, and suppressed headhunting and piracy. He had many Dayaks in his forces and said that only Dayaks can kill Dayaks anyway. So this is James Brooks' house. 
in Kuching in 1848. So this is how James Brooks' house looks like. This is how his house looks like. Can you, can you all see clearly over here? This is how his house used to look like. It's kind of like small house anyway. It's quite a small house, if I'm not mistaken. See, there's a boat. There's a boat nearby. Then there is a tree. Big coconut tree anyway. It looks like coconut tree anyway. Yep. Yep, you see, you see this? This is the black and white photo. It looks like this is at the Sarawak River right now in Estana, if I'm not mistaken. So this is Sarawak River. It's a very nice painting though. So back to so back to the info about James Brook right now. So Brook became the center of controversy in 1851 when accusations again against him of excessive use of force against the native people under the under the guise under the the guise of an anti-piracy operations ultimately led to the appointment of a commission of inquiry in Singapore in 1854 after the investigation the commission dismissed the charges but the accusations continued to harm him so, Brooke wrote to Alfred Russell Wallace on leaving England in April 1853 to assure Wallace that he would be very glad to see him at Sarawak. So, this was an invitation that helped Wallace decide on the Malay Archipelago for his next expedition, an expedition that lasts for eight years and established him as one of the foremost Victorian intellectuals and naturalists of the time. When Wallace arrived in Singapore in September 1854, he found Raja Brooke reluctantly preparing to give evidence to the special commission set up to investigate his controversial, controversial anti-piracy activities. So during his rule, Brooke suppressed an uprising by Liu Shanpang. I guess Liu, Liu Shanpang is the one, uh, it's notable, it's a notable people in Bau, right now in Siniawan, set up everything. Right now you see Liu Shanpang temple. Then back to his, back to, back to his rule, Brooke's rule. So, so he suppressed an uprising by Liu Shanpang in 1857 and faced threats from Sarawak warriors like Sheriff Masaho. And do you know sh who Sheriff Masaho is? Who Sheriff Masaho is? If I'm not mistaken, his name, I tell you what, you know, so, so Sheriff Masaho is a Malayan context, like died in 1890 in Selangor. If I'm not mistaken, right now, you know, I guess all of you know knew where Jalan Sharif Masaho is is at the is at the roundabout which you enter enter inside. It's just like nearly you know like this is a roundabout and then when you go into Hui Sing over there, that's Jalan Sharif Masaho. So and Rentap, I guess you all know Rentap as well. He's the fighter for um notable the the notable proverb Agi Idu Agi Ngelaban. He's so this means that he is when he's gonna be still alive, then he's gonna be still fighting and managed to suppress them as well. So he was a James Brooke was a great admirer of the novels of Jane Austen and would read them and reread them, including a lot of his companions. You know that? And in Sarawak. So he was influenced by the success of British British adventures, adventurers and uh, exploits to the British East India. His actions in Sarawak were directed at expanding British Empire and the benefits of its rule. So skip to that right now. I'm talking we're not talking about James Brook right now. We're gonna skip this and go back to the prehistory of Sarawak prehistory of Sarawak. That's enough of my, enough of James Brooke talking over here. So this is the prehistory. So it, so Sarawak as a state 
traces trace its root back its root back for forty thousand years ago, around like that. Forty thousand years ago, in Nia caves, when the foragers visited the west mouth of the caves, it, which was located one hundred and ten kilometers, aka sixty-eight miles southwest of Miri. 65,000 years ago, instead of 40,000 years ago, as previously believed, when Borneo was connected to the mainland of Southeast Asia. So the landscape around the Nia Caves was a drier and more exposed than it is now. More drier and exposed cave. So prehistorically, the Nia Caves were surrounded by the combination of closed forest with bush parklands, swamps and rivers so the foragers were so that they were able to survive in the rainforest through hunting, fishing and gathering molluscs and edible plants. So the new timeline of 65,000 years ago was established when five pieces of microlithic tools that were aged 65,000 years old and a modern human skull that that was aged 55,000 years ago were discovered at the part of the Nia Caves complex. So the trader cave during the excavation work. So this is the time where they found the modern human skull where they have to excavate it. So it's the earlier evidence. It's called a deep skull in a deep trench uncovered by Barbara and Tom Harrison, a British ethnologist. A British, I mean like British ethnologist in 1958. It's also the oldest human skull in Southeast Asia to not only Malaysia, not only in Malaysia actually. So the deep skull probably belongs to a 16 to 17 year old adolescent, adolescent girl. So when they compare with the Iban skulls and other fossils, the deep, deep skull most clear, closely resembles the indigenous people of Borneo today with their delicate features and small body size and it has few similarities with the skull of the indigenous Australians, Mesolithic and Neolithic burial sites have also been found. Then the area around the Nia Caves has been designated the Nia National Park. So, another earlier excavation by Tom Harrison in 1949 unearthed a series of Chinese ceramics at Santubong, which was near nearby Kuching. You know where Mount Santubong is? I guess you all know. So, so people found there. So that so that British ethnologist they unearthed a series of Chinese ceramics that date to the Tang and Song dynasties in the 8th to 19th century AD. It, it is possible that Santubong was an important seaport, which was right now we call that as Damai Beach. I guess it would be, have been like time from time to time already when I still remember that James Brook used to arrive used to arrive by the royalists starting from uh, starting from the this long coast long coast nearby then during the period but it's like important importance declined during the Yuan dynasty and the port was deserted during the Ming dynasty other archaeological sites in Sarawak can be found inside Kapit Song Syrian and Bao districts. It's a very small district anyway, if I'm not mistaken. So let's so let's talk about the Oak Kingdoms now. So the ancestors of the Dayaks are believed to have originated from South China based on the theory of population, the migration to Kalimantan or Borneo. Mikhail Kuman's 1987 two dots states. So this is the notable these are the notable theory, notable theory. You guys can read it over here further, further apart. So I guess it would have been like 
this is not about. So it is believed that the people at Yun, the people of Yunnan province in China at that time made the migration in search of a place of a place that was considered most able to provide freedom of the movement to earn a living, especially for farming and hunting. Apparently, the migration did not occur only once, but took place gradually as Kumans. So the first group to enter the Borneo region were the Negroid and we did groups called Austroasiatics. These are the first people who just arrived on one, one whole island, which are now extinct. So in Borneo, Kalimantan, but still exists in the Ifmus Peninsula and elsewhere in the island state. You know where if Ifmus Peninsula is? It's like Kuching Ifmus. No, you know Kuching Ifmus like Bonio Bonio Convention Center Kuching BCCK. If I'm not mistaken, then the Ifmus should be over here. So then followed by the larger group called the Proto Austronesians. This migration lasted another one thousand years between. 3,000 to between 3,000 and 105,000 BC. So it is further stated about that about 500 years before the Christ, there was before before Jesus Christ was born, there was another major migration from mainland Asia to the Indonesian islands. So these group are called Dutro. So according to G. Lee Rewood, 1993 to 1993.231, the Proto-Austronesians initially inhabited the coastal areas, but with the arrival of neutral Austronesians, the Proto-Austronesians moved inland, either to avoid conflicts or to gain better resources. Neutral Austronesians in particular have lived in one community, such as a longhouse, or village instead instead of being nomadics. So and know and and know the technique of dry land farming, namely shifting cultivation. So I repeat again here. Repeat again here. Repeat again here. Okay, so this is the coat. This is the coat. The coat of the coat of um the coat about Mikhail Kuman, the Kuman's coat, but it's like rotation like that. So if I'm not mistaken, this is a notable one. You want me to read it for you? If you want, then okay. So old old Ayak tribes belong to a group that migrated and and made from mainland Asia. The the Daya tribe is descended from the immigrants from the province now called Yunnan in southern China. From there, a small group traveled through Indochina to the Malaysian Peninsula, which became a stepping stone to enter the islands of Indonesia. So in addition, there may be groups who choose other stepping stones, namely through Hainan, Taiwan, and the Philippines. The migration was not so difficult because in the glacier, Show the glacial age, aka the ice age at that time, the sea level was very low. So that the even even with small boats they could cross waters that they could have been cross waters with the small boats at that time that separate the separate the islands a lot. So it could have been easier easier last time but right now we do need right now it's like very hot outside it's not an ice age anymore we're now in modern age so about the so so let's skip all those kingdoms and kingdoms and kingdoms right now let's go to this Bruneian empire and sultanate of Sarawak we don't want to waste time over here talking about kingdoms all right so wait did I receive? Yes, I received from Isaac. Hello, Isaac. There we go. So, the Bruneian Empire and the Sultanate of Sarawak. So, this is a view of the river from the anchor, anchorage of Sarawak. It's by Edward Inglefield, probably when he was a lieutenant on HMS Samarang. Samarang. 
painting from the National Maritime Museum of London. This is the painting of Sarawak River. Back then, it's quite a long time, quite a long time picture. Right now, we we do have a, uh, right now we do have waterfront, waterfront. Right now, there are buildings, main bazaar, main bazaar, and all those buildings around here. It's this is the painting back then when there was only small boats where you could cross over. So this is entirely trees that time, entirely a group of trees that time. So there's nothing much to nothing much to sightsee sightsee this Sarawak at that time. So nothing has happened. So so yeah, right now we have a lot of things to see. So in the 16th century, the Kuching area was known to Portuguese cartographers as Sarawak, one of the five great seaports on the island of Borneo. It's called Sarawak, Sarawak Seaport. So during its golden age, Brunei under Nakot, Nakot Raga Sultan Bolkiah from 1473 to 1521 AD managed to conquer the Santubong Kingdom in 1512. So for the short period of time, it was self-governed under the Sultan of Brunei's younger brother, Sultan Tengah in 1599. The new sultan's younger brother, Pangiran Muda Tengah, also wanted to become the sultan of Brunei by claiming himself rightful successor on the basis, basis of having been born when his father became the crown prince. So Sultan Abdul Jalilui, Jalilul Akbar responded by proclaiming Pangiran Muda Tengah as Sultan of Sarawak, as at that time Sarawak was a territory administered by Brunei. It was a vassal state to Brunei, if I'm not mistaken. This is what I've repeated easier for you. So, yeah, with his death, I mean, like, I mean, like, wait. Wait a second. Sultan Tengah was killed at Batu Buaya in 1641. One of his, by one of his, one of his followers. It's like bodyguard being killed. That that Sultan was being killed by his bodyguards anyway. So he was buried in Kampong Batu Buaya. So with his death, the Sultanate of Sarawak came to an end. Later consolidated into Brunei once more again. So by the early 19th century, Sarawak became become loosely became a loosely governed territory under the control of Brunei Sultanate. So the Bruneian Empire had authority only along with the coastal regions of Sarawak held by semi-independent Malay leaders. Meanwhile, the interior of Sarawak suffered from tribal wars fought by Iban, Kayan, Kenya peoples who aggressively aggressively fought to expand the territory territories anyway. So it was followed by the discovery of antimony one in the Kuching region. Pangiran Indera Makota, who was the representative of the Sultan of Brunei, began to develop the territory between 1824 and 1830. So when the antimony production increased, the Brunei Sultan demanded higher taxes from Sarawak. This led to civil unrest and chaos. In 1839, Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin, 1827-1852, ordered his uncle, Pangiran Muda Hashim, to restore order. So, Pangiran Muda Hashim requested the assistance of British sailor James Brooke in the matter, but Brooke refused. So, so fun fact about it here. So, the, you know who the founder is? Founder of Kuching is, let me tell you right now. It's inside, it's what I've told you earlier. It's Pangiran in Indera Makota. He was the founder founder of Sarawak at that time, but right now it's called Kuching. So this is why without without Kuching, this would have been like lots of trees anyway, and we are not exist. Everything will not exist, will not be existed like right now. But lucky we have this guy, this guy who wants to who wanted to expand Kuching as their right to their right to do everything about it. So, however, in 1841, during his 
Next visit to Sarawak in 1841, he agreed to a repeated request. Pangiran Buddha Hashim signed the treaty in 1841, surrendering Sarawak to Brook. The treaty, like the treaty of, he signed the treaty like the treaty of Versailles. So it's, uh, so, so he agreed the repeated request. Everything, everything is going to be passed on to Brook. Going to be passed on to pass on to him anyway, not them. Like it's him, one person. So this appointment was later confirmed by the Sultan of Brunei in 1842. In 1843, James Brooke decided to create a pro-British Brunei government by installing Pangiran Muda Hashim into the Brunei court, as he would take Brooke's advice, forcing Brunei to appoint Hashim under the guns of East India's company. Company Street Steam Steamer. Wait, sorry. Um, forcing Brunei to appoint Hashim under the guns of East India Company's Steamer, flag the the flagaton. The Brunei court was unhappy with Hashim's appointment and had him assassinated in 1845. 1845. Sorry, I'm still stammering, stammering over here. It's just only the first time, alright. So, in retaliation. James Brooke attacked Kampong Ayer, the capital of Brunei. After the incident, the Sultan of Brunei sent an apology letter to Queen Victoria. The Sultan also confirmed James Brooke's possession, possession of Sarawak and his mining rights of antimony without paying tribute to Brunei. In 1846, Brooke effectively became the Raja of Sarawak and founded the White Raja of White Raja Dynasty of Sarawak. So, fun fact, another fun fact. So, so another fun fact is that it's Kampong. It's called Kampong Ai at that time, the capital of Brunei. So right now it's called Bandar Sri. Right now the capital of Brunei is called Bandar Sri Begawan. So that's it. So the Brook Dynasty. Sorry, I have to close the door for the moment because my sister is distracting over here. I have to lock the door. A sec. My god, this has been epic. This has been a bit epic those days. Lucky I just locked the door. Locked the door at this room. So let me let me repeat this Brook dynasty again, alright? So James Brook ruled the area and expanded the territory northwards until his death in 1868. He succeeded by his nephew, Charles Anthony Johnson Brook, which was called not commonly called Charles Brook. You know you know who it is. It's the second white Raja. So who in turn was succeeded by his son, Charles Viner Brook, Charles V. Brook, the third one, the last white Raja, on the condition that Charles Anthony should rule in consultation with Viner Brook, Brook's brother Bertram. Bertram, both James and Charles Anthony pressured Brunei to sign treaties as the strategy to acquire territories from Brunei and expand the territorial boundaries of Sarawak. In 1861, Brunei ceded the Bintulu region to James Brook. Sarawak was recognized by as an independent state by the United States in 1850 and the United Kingdom in 1864. The state issued its first currency as the Sarawak dollar in 1858. Right now, we're, we're currently using Malaysian ringgit because we've already entered Malaysia, by the way. So, so yeah, that's it. So... In 1883, Sarawak was extended to the Baram River, which was near Miri. The Baram River was in Miri. Limbang was added, and then the final expansion, it was last followed by Lawas. It was ceded to the Brook government. 
and Sarawak was divided into five divisions corresponding to the territorial boundaries of the areas acquired by the Brooks throughout the years. Each division was headed by one resident only. So this is the royalist. This is the royalist. Royal, the picture of royalist. It was a very, very big ship. Very, very big ship. Navy ship. It, it looks like this back then, but right now it kind of looks something different that you always see. You always see in other countries like that. So, yep. We're... All right, let's stop talking about ships, okay? Sarawak became a British protectorate in 1888, while still ruled by the Brook dynasty. So it's 400 years as White Rajas. The Brooks adopted a policy of paternalism to protect the interests of the indigenous population and their overall welfare. So while the Brook government established a Supreme Council consisting of Malay chiefs to advise the Rajas on all aspects of the governance. So in the Malaysian context, Brook family is viewed as a colonialist. The Supreme Council is the oldest state legislative assembly in Malaysia, with the first general council meeting taking place at Bintulu in 1867 at that time the dune the dune was at bintulu because that is the first the first dune before moving on and moving on and moving on until kuching right now we have a big dune we have a big dune that you always see from the waterfront so Meanwhile, the Ibans and other Dayaks people were hired as militia. militia. The Brook dynasty encouraged the immigration of Chinese merchants for economic development, especially in the mining and agricultural sectors. West, Western, businessmen, Western businessmen were restricted from entering the state, while Christian missionaries were tolerated. Piracy, slavery, and headhunting, everything banned. It's banned. Bonio Company Limited was formed in 1856. It was involved in a wide range of businesses in Sarawak, such as trade, banking, agriculture, mineral, mineral exploration, development, and whatever it is important for the state to, for the state, for the territories to have. It's it's the number one must have. So, yeah. So this is how they expand Sarawak. So this is the map. It's the GIF. It's the GIF of how Sarawak expand its territory from a vessel, from being a vessel, from being a vessel state of Brunei. This is, this is the GIF of how they expand, how they expand Sarawak from like from the territory of brunei so this is it they're gonna surrender the bruneian empire ha 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 there we go in 1857 500 hakka chinese gold miners from bau under the leadership of new champang destroyed the brook's house brook escaped and organized a bigger army together with his nephew charles and his malayo iban supporters a few days later, Brooks' army was able to cut off the escape route, escape route of the Chinese rebels, who were defeated after two months of fighting. It's been taking two months. It's the worst thing. Two months of fighting. The worst. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for that. Sorry for that disturbance. Anyway, so the Brooks subsequently built a new government house by the Sarawak River at Kuching. An anti-Brook faction at the at the Brunei court was defeated in 1860 at Muka. Other notable rebellions that that were successfully quashed by the Brooks including include those led by an Iban leader, Rentap, and a Malay leader, Sharif Masaho. And as a result, a series of forts were built around Kuching to consolidate Raja's power. So the notable ones include Fort Magrita, 
which was completed in 1879, and in 1891, Charles Anthony Brook established the Sarawak Museum, the oldest museum in Borneo. In 1899, Charles Anthony Brook ended the intertribal wars in Marudi. The first oil well was drilled in 1910. Two years later, the Brook Dockyard opened. You know, you know where the Brook Dockyard, the Northern World Brook Yard, Brook Dockyard is is at the Gambier, is off the Gambier Street. But right now, it's being renovated into Brook Dockyard Maritime Museum. So two years later, the Brook Dockyard opened. This is what I've repeated. Anthony Brook was born in the same year and became Raja Muda in 1939. It's like Crown Prince. So in 1941, during the centenary celebration of Brook rule in Sarawak, a constitution was introduced to limit the power of the Raja to allow the Sarawak people to play a greater role in the functioning of the government. Big roles, anyway. However, the draft included a secret agreement drawn up between Charles Vinerbrook and British government officials in which Vinerbrook ceded Sarawak as a British crown colony in return for a financial compensation to him and his family until, until he is dead. Until, until Vinerbrook is dead was that yep about the japanese occupation anyway this is the aerial view of before before we head on before we carry on to this so this is the this is the batu lintang camp the notable batu lintang camp if i'm not mistaken ah there we go i have seen someone seen someone i've seen you i've seen you anyway i will be your moderator okay your moderator. There we go. Rex um, Rigzo is now a moderator. So there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Next thing. The next thing. Here is the Batu Lintang camp. I repeat again here. I repeat again here. This is the Batu Lintang camp, which is now, which is now somewhere in Batu Lintang, nearby the water boat the notable Kuching water board but it's deep down from deep down from SMK Batuling Tang and the location I still remember right now is near it's like probably probably few KMs to Jalan Ong Tiang Sui so that's the old old and notable ones if I'm not mistaken do you want show like this this is the this is the place where this is the place all those houses yep there we go there we go the brook government under the leadership of charles viner brook established several airstrips in kuching oya muka bintulu and miri for preparations in the events of war by 1941 the british had withdrawn its defending forces from Sarawak to Singapore. With Sarawak now unguarded, the Brook regime decided to adopt a scorched earth policy where oil installations in Miri would be destroyed and the Kuching airfield will be held as long as possible before being destroyed. Meanwhile, Japanese forces seized British Borneo to guard their eastern flank in the Malayan campaign to and to facilitate their invasion of Sumatra and West Java. A Japanese invasion force led by Kiyotake Kawaguchi landed in Miri on 16 December 18... No, no, no. 1941. Eight days. Eight days. Look at here. Look at here. Eight days into the Malayan campaign and conquered Kuching on... 24th December 1941. This is the worst thing ever. If if your grand if your grandparents, I bet your if your great grandparents have experienced this, I bet they experienced the worst thing ever. The worst campaign ever. I mean like it's the worst the worst thing for you and your grandparents. But lucky they are still surviving anyway. I bet I bet some of your great grand I bet most of your great grandparents are already dead. 
already dead back then like back back then few years ago or few months or recently so yeah back to this back to this time anyway so so yeah uh so yeah British forces led by Lieutenant Colonel C.M. Lane retreated to Singawang in Dutch Borneo, the, the Dutch Borneo bordering Sarawak. After 10, 10 entire weeks, the 10 worst weeks of fighting in Dutch Borneo, the Allied forces surrendered on 1st April 1942. When the Japanese invaded Sarawak, Charles Vinerbrook had already left for Sydney, Australia, while his officers were captured by the Japanese and interned but at the Batu Lintang camp. So it is remained the, the state remained our state has remained remained the part of the Empire of Japan. The for three years and eight months. So Sarawak together with North Borneo and Brunei. The whole thing. The whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, formed a single administrative unit named Kita Borneo, Northern Borneo, under the Japanese 37th Army headquartered in Kuching, Sarawak. Sarawak was divided into three provinces, namely Kuching Shu, Sibu Shu, and Miri Shu, each under their respective Japanese provincial governor. The Japanese retained pre-war administrative machinery, machinery and assigned Japanese for the government positions. The administrative of Sarawak's interior was left to the native police and village headmen under Japanese supervision, though the Malays were typically re recept receptive toward the Japanese other and the other indigenous tribes such as Iban, Kayan, Kenya and Kalabit and Lun Bawang maintained a hostile attitude toward them because of policies such as compulsory labor forced forced deliveries of foodstuffs and confiscation of firearms. The Japanese did not resort to strong measures in clamping down onto the Chinese population. So it was because the Chinese in the state were generally apolitical. However, a considerable number of Chinese moved from urban areas into the less accessible interior to lessen the contact with the Japanese. So Allied forces later formed the Z Special Unit to sabotage all the Japanese operations in Southeast Asia. So beginning in March 1945, Allied commanders were parachuted into Borneo jungles and established several bases in Sarawak under an operation codenamed Samut, which means ant. Hundreds of indigenous people were trained to launch offensives against Japanese. During the Battle of North Borneo, the Australian forces landed at Lutong Miri area, the Lutong Airport, on 20th June 1945, and had penetrated as far as Marudi and Limbang before, before halting, halting their operations in Sarawak. After the surrender of Japan, the Japanese surrendered to the Australian forces at Labuan on 10th September 1945. This was followed by the official surrender ceremony at Kuching aboard the Australian Corvette HMA Hunda on 11th September 1945. The Batu Lingang camp was liberated on the same day. Sarawak was immediately placed under BMA, British Military Administration, on April 1946. So this is the map of Kuching at that time. I mean, like, this is the map of Borneo. Borneo, if I'm not mistaken. This is the map of Borneo. If you can see it closely. The first image shows you the map of Borneo. Do you want to clearly see it? Okay, there we go. I, I'll show you right now. This is the map of Borneo in 1943. And this is the crowd gathering, gathering at the streets, gathering in Main Bazaar. So this is the official surrender ceremony of the Japanese to the Australian forces. Another one. A large world map 
showing the Japanese occupied area in Asia set up in the main street of Sarawak's capital. So there we go. That's it for the Japanese occupation. So the next one will be talking about the British Crown Colony. So the British Crown Colony here. After the war, the Brook government did not have enough resources to rebuild Sarawak. Charles Viner Brook was also not willing to hand over his power to his heir apparent. Anthony Brooke, his nephew, the only son of Bertram Brooke, because of serious differences between them. Furthermore, Viner's Brooke's wife, Sylvia Brett, tried to defame Anthony Brooke in order to install her daughter to the throne. Faced with these problems, Viner decided to cede sovereignty of Sarawak to the British Crown. So a session bill was put forth in the Council Negri, nowadays called Sarawak State Legis Legislative Assembly, Dewan Undangan Negeri Sarawak, and was debated for three days. The bill was passed on 17 May 1946 with a narrow majority, 19 versus 16 votes. Supporters of the bill were mostly European officers, while the Malays opposed the bill. This caused hundreds of Malay civil servants to resign in protest, sparking an anti-session movement and the, and the assassination of the second colonial governor, governor of Sarawak, Sir Duncan Stewart by Rosley Dobby. So Duncan George Stewart was a British colonial administrator and aka second governor of Sarawak. So in so that's it. So for this he was banished from Sarawak by the colonial government and was allowed to return only 17 years later of a nostalgic visit when Sarawak became part of Malaysia. Malaysia. This is the worst thing ever. In 1950, all anti-session movements in Sarawak ceased after a clamp down by the colonial government. So in 1951, yay, Anthony relinquished all his claims to the Sarawak throne after he used up all the last legal avenue at the at the Privy Council. So so yay, we're we're done. So, so the self we're done about the British Crown Colony right now. So the last topic we're gonna talk about was the self government in the Federal of Malaysia, the Federation of Malaya. So this is Tan Sri Dato Amar Stephen Kalong Ningkan, the first CM, the first CM of Sarawak on declaring the formation of the former Federation of Malaysia on the 16th September 1963. This is the picture. This is the picture of the this is the picture of the the picture of the parade declaration. Sorry for this interruption over here. I bet you can see this is this is him in the middle of the in the this is him in the middle of middle of all these people right now. So on 27 May 1961, Tunku Abdul Rahman, the first Prime Minister of the Federation of Malaya, announced a plan to form a greater federation together with Sapos, Rawak, Sabah and Brunei to be called Malaysia. This plan caused the local leaders in Sarawak to be wary of Tunku's intentions in view of the great disparity in social economic development between Malaya and the Borneo states. There was a general fear without a strong political institution, so the Borneo states would have been subjected to Malaya's colonization. Therefore, various political parties in Sarawak emerged to protect the interests of the communities they represented. On 17th January 1962, the Cobalt Commission was formed to gauge the support of Sarawak and Sabah for the proposed federation. Between February and April 1962, the commission met more than 40,000, no, 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 sorry, sorry, more than 4,000 people and received 200 and, no, 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 sorry, um, 2,000 and 200 memoranda from various groups. I have a uh, stammering over here. 
I'm stammering over here. Sorry, sorry, guys. So the commission reported divided support among the Borneo population. However, Tunku interpreted the figures as 80% support for the Federation Sarawak proposed an 18 point memorandum to safeguard its interests in the Federation. In September 1962, the Sarawak Council Negri, now Sarawak State Legislat Legislative Assembly, passed a resolution that supported the Federation with a condition that the interests of the Sarawakians would not would not be compromised compromised on 23rd October 1962 five political parties in Sarawak formed a united front that supported the for formation of Malaya then Sarawak was officially granted self government on 22nd July 1963 which was 59 years ago 59 years ago this is why we celebrated Sarawak Day and formed the Federation of Malaysia with Malaya, North Borneo and Sarawak no 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 sorry Singapore on 16 September 1963 which was called Malaysia Day we celebrated Malaysia Day on the 16th of September anyway so that's the that's the thing so this is the Sarawak Rangers. This is the Sarawak Rangers leap from a Royal Australian Air Force Bell UH-1 IOQs, IOQs helicopter to guard the Malay Thai border from the potential attacks in 1965. So this is Sarawak. These are the Sarawak Rangers from the helicopter. So. The Malaysian Federation had drawn opposition from the Philippines, Indonesia, Brunei People's Party, and the Sarawak-based communist groups. The Philippines and Indonesia claimed that the British would be neo-colonizing the Borneo states through the Federation. Meanwhile, A.M. Azahari, leader of the Brunei People's Party, instigated the Brunei revolt in December 1962 to prevent Brunei from joining the Malaysia the Malaysian Federation so this is why they don't like this is why the Bruneians don't like Brunei to be formed as Malaysia to be formed in Malaysia so right now Brunei is being separated to know why so Azari seized Limbang and Bakanu Bakanu before being defeated by British military forces sent from Singapore claiming that the Brunei revolt was solid evidence evidence for the of opposition to the Malaysian Federation. Indonesian president, the first Indonesian president, Sukarno, ordered a military confrontation with Malaysia, sending armed volunteers and later military forces into Sarawak, which became a flashpoint during the Indonesia-Malaysia confrontation between 1962 and 1966. The confrontation gained little support from Sarawakians except from the Sarawak communists. Thousands of, thousands of communist members went into Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, and underwent training with the Communist Party of Indonesia. During the confrontation, around 10,000 to 150,000 British troops were stationed in Tustra together with Australian and New Zealand troops. When Suharto, the second Indonesian president, replaced Sukarno, negotiations were restarted between Malaysia and Indonesia, which led to the end of confrontation on 11th August 1966. After the formation of the People's Republic of China in 1949, the ideology of Maoism, the Mao Zedong's Maoism, started to influence Chinese schools in Sarawak. So the first communist group in Sarawak was formed in 1951 with its origins in the Chunghua Middle School Kuching. The group was succeeded by the Sarawak Liberation League, SLL, in 1954. Its activities spread from schools to trade unions and farmers. They were mainly concentrated in the southern and central regions of Sarawak. So the communist members successfully 
penetrated the Sarawak United People's Party, SUPP, SLL, tried to, to release a communist state in Sarawak through constitutional means. means. But during the confrontation period, it resorted to armed struggle against the government. So the two notable leaders, so there were the two notable leaders of the SLL over here. One is Wang Ming Chuan and another one is Bong Chi Chok. Bong Chi Chok. No, no, sorry, sorry. Bong Chi Chok. Following this, the Sarawak government relocated Chinese villagers into security guarded settlements along the Kuching Syrian road to prevent the communists from getting material support from the villagers. The North Kalimantan Communist NKCP, also known as Clandestine Communist Organization CCO by the government sources, and was formally set up in 1970. In 1970, in 1970, Bongki Chok surrendered to surrendered to the third to the third chief minister, Abdul Rahman Yaqub, this, significant, this significantly reduced the strength of the Communist Party. However, Wong, who had directed the CCO from China since the mid-60s, the mid called for the armed struggle against the government, which after 1974 continued in the Rajang Delta. In 1989, the Malayan Communist Party, MCP, signed a peace agreement with the government of Malaysia so this caused the NKCP to reopen negotiations with the Sarawak government, which led to a peace agreement on 17th October 1990. Peace was restored in Sarawak after the final group of 50 communist guerrillas laid down their arms. So that's it about the that's it about the last one. So we are going to so we are going to end this with three with the history of the history of the Sarawak state anthems so i am going to research the state anthems right now wait a second so the first thing so the first thing it's the lyrics i mean like it's the timeline for the historical national colonials and state anthems. So the historical national colonial and state anthems go the the first national and the first state anthem is is called Gone Forth Beyond the Sea from 1872 to 1946. The anthem of the Raj of Sarawak. And then followed by the Phelan Sarawak. 1946 to 1973 so i would just i would just put i would just i would just put the i'll just put the felon the felon shower anthem for you right now let me mute Okay, right now I'm allowed to unmute unmute all those things right now. So this is the so this is the first the first state anthem of Sarawak. Phelan Sarawak. Okay. Let's start with the let's start with the first one from 1946 to 1972. can hear the state the first state in terms
So this was the first state anthem of Sarawak. Second thing I'm going to show you is the second, the second state anthem. Second state anthem, Sarawak Bahagia. But before this, I'm gonna show you the, I'm gonna show you what is Sarawak. I'm, I'm gonna show you this info, the a little bit of an info before we get to the, before we get to this, to this thing. So Sarawak Bahagia, it was the, it was. It was the second state anthem being used from 1973 to 1988. So I will put the uh, I'll put the second state anthem right now. So this is the second one. Okay. Sorry, sorry for this. That's it. So, the next up, the third one. So the third one, the current, the third one, is the current state anthem, Ibu Petiwiku. This, this um, this state anthem was being used from 1988 from since 1988 okay this is the current state anthem of Sarawak so I bet you all know the lyrics so yeah please rise Okay, it's time for me to unmute this one right now. So this is the last one for today, all right? This is the last thing.
That's it. That's it. That's it for all of you. So I bet this is this is done for today. This is the end of the live streaming right now. So I will just leave you all leave you instead. So you may leave you may leave this app right now. So that's it. Carry on, you may leave right now.